Welcome to Confessions of a Parent Coach. I'm coach, a mother of four, and potty talker, Ann Kaplan. This is the podcast where I confess something from my own parenting and coaching life, teach a lesson around it, and answer your questions. Even we parenting experts are far from perfect, and the real magic happens when we get down with all that imperfection. We get into the gritty side of parenting here, so earbud up and dive in. Welcome into another episode of the podcast, listeners. I am in a podcast recording frenzy, hot on the tails of an amazing group call today. Our calls are on Thursdays, and today is a Thursday, so I am actually doing my dad's group calls and my mom's group calls on Thursdays these days, and that means that I am like within a really short amount of time interacting with lots and lots and lots of parents and hearing lots of common themes, lots of ideas, all of this stuff. And that's really cool because that really sparks my ideas and my creative solution, you know, sort of hive mind in my brain. And I come away from these group calls often with like so many ideas of stuff that I want to share with you all. So what better time than a Thursday to record a few podcast episodes. And today was such a great day. We had several moms on the group call who were dealing with something that is super common, by the way, like I actually have yet to talk to parents, especially if I work for with you for a long time. So like if you're in the group and you've, um, are work in the group program, That means you're in there forever, basically. That group program is kind of a, you pay once and you're with me until I retire kind of dealio, which is super sweet. I defy you to find a better setup anywhere on the planet for this kind of level of support. But if that means that you're, you know, uh, participating in the group for a long period of time, like I start to, you know, really touch on lots and lots and lots of topics with you. Every week we might be talking about something different. And so, especially with my clients who I've been working with for a long time, I don't think I've ever worked with somebody for more than a few months and not talked about this topic at least once. And that is the topic of when you're not the preferred parent, when you have that like knife in your heart moment of listening to your kids say, daddy's more fun than you are, or mommy's more fun than you are, or, you know. I want so-and-so to put me to bed. I don't want you to put me to bed or, you know, the just look of disappointment on our kids' faces when it's like, oh, well, your other parent's going out for the night. I'm going to be the one making dinner and they're, they're like crestfallen or whatever. Like, could there be anything more heartbreaking than watching your kid feel disappointed to be stuck with you? And that is a topic that one of the topics that came up today in the group call. And I thought, gosh, this is a really great topic for discussion on the podcast because I think it's a universal experience. And that kind of brings me to my um, confession for today. I am not the fun parent in our parenting dyad at all. That might not surprise you. Like I'm the one who's the quote unquote discipline expert. I'm the one who's really focusing on like, what does good parenting mean? And so you've heard me, if you listen to the podcast for a while, you've heard me like, I mean business, right? Like I don't mess around. I really take this stuff seriously. It's super important to me. I'm not super like, woohoo. I'm not the like really fun, you know, let's just you know, go throw the ball around or wrestle or make a huge mess or break all the rules or gorge ourselves on treats or have a movie marathon. Like that's not me. And I actually over time have uh, come to read, redescribe the, those with that word, the fun parent, but we'll get to that later. But really my confession for you is not that I'm not the fun parent because you probably could have guessed that. If there is a fun parent in every parenting dyad, I bet you could have guessed that I'm probably not the fun one. (laughs) But the confession for you is that that really does get to me sometimes. And you, that part might feel like a little bit of a surprise to you. Like I do this work all the time. I help parents through this all of the time, but it does bother me. It bothers me that my kids come to me for certain things, but they do not come to me for the fun stuff. And especially when I'm in a low place for any of you Enneagram junkies out there, I'm an Enneagram type one. And that means that when we're in a low place, we actually get pretty like 
uh, woe is me attitude and see ourselves as like uniquely isolated and nobody wants us around and stuff like that. And that definitely happens to me sometimes when I'm in a low place, my kids feelings about me and behaviors around me compared to my husband absolutely feed into my story that, you know, people need me around. They don't want me around. In fact, I think I've actually said that exact sentence to people before, like, I'm the kind of person that's really handy to have around and I definitely get stuff done and I am really great caretaker and, you know, all of that stuff. But I'm not the kind of person that you're thinking of when you're ready to have a good time. That's just me. That's the story anyways that I tell myself. And it does get to me sometimes. It really, really bugs me. And I'm going to tell you a story from when, let's see, my oldest kiddo was probably three and a half or four. And I had, for the first time ever as a mom, I had gone to visit my friend Jolie. If she's listening, shout out Jolie. I have a really great friend from college who lives in Asheville, North Carolina, which is a super fun city. And um, I had a, I had a three year old, and I had a little one year old. And I, for the first time since I had my kids, I went on a girls' trip. I went to go visit my friend Jolie, and I took my little baby with me, but I left my toddler at home with my husband. And on the way back from the airport, I had this genius idea that I was going to surprise Elijah with a razor, you know, the scooter things. He had been talking about one and had a friend who had one. And I was going to be like the cool mom and like show up, the super fun mom show up and, you know, surprise them with this gift. And so I stopped and I, you know, got the razor or whatever. And it was in the back of the car. And when we got home, I was like bringing my luggage into the house and then I was going to go back and get the razor out of the car and Mike got it out of the car. And, um, I got so angry because Mike got to be the one, you know, I, pres I actually, I think I, I got Mike to give it to me. So I was the one who presented it to the kids, but, um, it, you know, it had to be put together, you know, they fold over. So you have to be able to like, kind of open it up and, and have the little handlebars and stuff like that. And, um, the second the kids got it, they turned to Mike and were like, was like, will you help us set it up? And will you go razoring with us? And I was furious and irrationally, I was furious at Mike. It wasn't his fault that the kids had done that, but I was so angry that like I had done this thing purposely to position myself as the fun parent. And even then I had gotten like relegated to the not fun parent. Like I'm the one who's going to have quesadillas waiting for you after you go razoring. I'm not the one who's going to go razoring with you. I'm not the one who would surprise you with a really fun present or whatever. And I really, it was <laughs> terrible. It's really funny. I haven't, this podcast helps me think about things that I, I really haven't thought about in years and really helps me. It's actually really great in one way because I get to look back on my, evolution as a parent and be like, wow, like I would never act that way today. But I, I really lost my mind with Mike and I had a blow up fight. It was really like epic and what a terrible way to start my, like coming back home after being away and all this stuff. And it was all because it's super triggering to think that your kids don't like you. I mean, let's get down to what we're really saying when we say, you know, my kid loves their days with this person and not with me um, if you're separated or my kid just prefers my, you know, co-parent over me all the time. Like what we're really saying, and especially when kids say it straight to our face, because then that, you know, kids say the darndest kind of way that they have about them. Like it is painful because we're basically these things, these creatures that we love more than anything on the planet don't like us. That's what it feels like when our kids say, you know, I don't want you to put me to bed. I don't like you. I like this person more than I like you, blah, blah, blah. And especially when it comes over and over and over again. And can I tell you in consultations, when I have these, my, you know, potential clients setting up discovery calls with me, that's actually something we talk about a lot. You might be surprised at how often it comes up in a discovery call, this feeling of like, our kid really prefers one of us to the other. And it's really causing problems because the parent who's preferred can also start to become resentful, right? Like, it's like, I don't want to put you to bed every single night. Go with your other parent, right? It's hard 
it's hard when there's that discrepancy. It's painful when it feels like your kid doesn't like you. It's painful when it feels like your kid doesn't like your partner. And so you can't, you know, rely on them and step out and give yourself a break. Like it's tricky all the way around. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that, um, Kids often, almost always, prefer one parent to the other, and that preference changes over time. So no matter how much you think you might have, you know, a mama's boy, for example, or a daddy's girl, or whatever you think you have, trust me, it will not be that way forever. Those those things will t- change. So if that's true, which it is, if that's true, if it's true that our kids' preferences around one parent or the other are changeable and sort of ephemeral, then it would be kind of crazy for us to take this like temporary momentary thing and make it mean something really permanent and painful and um, judgmental about us. Like I must not be as fun or I must not be delivering as much as the other parent or there's something the matter with me. Like if we know that our kids are going to change tomorrow, you know, it's kind of like today, my kid's favorite color is blue. Next week, it might be green. If I'm deciding to take it super seriously that my kid's favorite color is blue this week, and I go out and buy all blue everything, and my kid's room looks like a Smurf explosion, I'm going to be really sorry next week when green is in and blue is out. That is literally what happens with parents. Think about that. Like, are we really going to take these quote unquote phases or fads so seriously. So that's the first thing I want to put out there for you. That's kind of the low hanging fruit on this. Like if, if this is where you're at, like how helpful, it might be helpful for you to just realize like this too shall pass. Like this really isn't a forever state, but for some parents, it feels that way. Cause it could be like your entire kid's toddlerhood that you're not the preferred parent or whatever. So the second thing I'm going to say is the worst thing you can do is try to be in a contest with your co-parent about being fun or preferred or the favorite or whatever. Um, Because what's going to happen once we get into that whole compare and despair attitude, we'll try to be like the other person, but we're not. We're not like the other person. Like you can't be like your co-parent because you're not your co-parent. And it really takes the focus off of the amazing, wonderful, magical things that you bring to the table that your kid, especially if they're younger, might not really appreciate, but it actually is something that they are um, benefiting from and probably actually even are conscious of, but not in this way that's like, well, you took me to McDonald's. It's much more like, well, you've made sure that I, you know, I'm always on time to school. You make sure that you know, I always have lunch at school. Like those things might not be the things that kids consciously say out loud to you, but that doesn't mean they're not aware of them. So I want to offer to you, number one, stop trying to be someone you're not. So leave any sort of, you know, comparison or trying to keep up with each other energy by the wayside. And that's doubly true for separated parents, because now we can be in the situation that's super not good for kids. So that that's one thing, but then also just consider the fact that your child is aware of all that you bring to their life because they're experiencing all of the things that you're bringing to their life. That might not mean that they're at the pay grade level just yet to be able to verbalize or put two and two together, but that doesn't mean that they're not aware of what you're bringing to their life or how you enhance their life for them. So, you know, just kind of consider that. Okay. And then the last thing I'm going to say is let's think about what do we do when we feel this feeling. And if you're working with me, this is going to be like, oh, here she goes with her two parallel tracks thing. Everything you do with me. And if you go back and listen to any of the podcasts, if you read any of my blogs or my emails, if you decide to come to one of my free events, whatever, you'll see this is omnipresent. And if you're working with me, go ahead and look at your workbook if you don't believe me. Um, Every single thing that we do as parents has these two parallel tracks. It has these two sort of sides of the coin. One of the sides is the actual skills. Like, what do we do? What should we do when we feel like our um, kid likes the other parent more than than they like us? Or 
we not just think that we quote unquote know it because they've told us that. What do we do? So that's that like, okay, action, skills, the X, Y, Z, you know, the Ikea instructions of how to construct a parent child relationship. That's one, that's one side of that coin. That's one of those parallel tracks. The other is what's going on internally. Let's look at what makes it hard to do the stuff that's in that Ikea instruction manual, for example, what makes these emotions arise in you? Why does it bother you that your kid might think that your partner is better than you as a parent or something like that? If we don't address that stuff, the whole that to-do list, that whole like instruction manual stuff, it just doesn't happen because in order for us to actually follow those instructions for just to use those tools and, um, and follow those directions on great parenting that all of the stuff that are the ingredients of great parenting are predicated on us being calm and centered and doing our own personal work so we have to have those two parallel tracks so this situation's no exception like I would really encourage you to sit down and say like why is it a problem if my kid likes somebody else better than they like me And this kind of is a little bit reminiscent of what we talked about in the disrespect podcast episodes. If you haven't heard that, you might want to go back and listen. Um, Where does it say that you have to be loved and liked by your child? Is that really a rule? Is that owed to you? And is it okay if we're, if we're trying to raise our kids in this world where every single Human emotion is not a problem. You are allowed to feel all the things. The entire spectrum of human emotion is available to you, child. If that's true, that means one of the emotions they might be allowed to feel is dislike for you. Or like I said in the podcast, the disrespect podcast, disrespect might be one of the feelings they might be allowed to feel for you. They might be allowed to like somebody more than they like you? And is that really a problem? Now, intellectually, we can say, well, I guess not, especially when I put it that way, right? (laughs) Well, when you put it that way, I guess it's not a problem for my kid to like somebody else better than they like me. But emotionally, it does feel that way. It feels like it is a problem. Like I want to be loved and liked by my child. And I definitely don't want to feel like I'm not doing as good of a job as my co-parent, my partner, whatever. And then I come back to the same question. Well, why not? Why would it be a problem for your co-parent to be nailing it in certain areas that you're not, if that could be true? Could that be true? And could that not be a problem? I'm not saying it actually is true. Just because your kid likes your co-parent better than they like you doesn't mean that um, your co-parent is actually doing a better job than you are. In fact, sometimes it means the opposite. But uh, what if we were able to approach parenting from this lens of like all of those things are allowed to be possible. It could be that I'm not nailing it as well as my co-parent is in this current moment or in these certain arenas. That's allowed to be true. And it's not even something I necessarily need to change. It doesn't mean anything bad. It's not a problem. Not only is it allowed to be true, I'm allowed to think that that's okay and it's not a problem and I don't need to get upset about it. What if we approach parenting from the lens that, um, you know, it's not a problem for our kid not to like us. That's okay. Our kids are allowed to feel all of those feelings. Once again, not only is that allowed to exist, but I actually might not even need to change that. If you were able to feel this way about this particular topic, I just want you to imagine like how differently would you parent? How differently would you parent? I have clients all the time come to me and say, my kid told me they like daddy better than me. What, how can I be different so that my child will like me more? Literally, I'm not even paraphrasing. That is a question that I have received. Or what should I do? So, and, or I'll, I'll hear from my, the the most common thing is I'll hear from my client. I don't understand why they don't like being with me. I took them to the zoo. We made cupcakes. I let them watch their favorite movie when it's my day, uh, the kid sleeps in bed with me. You know, it's like all this great stuff. Like they're almost trying to make a case for why they actually are just as fun as their, you know, parenting counterpart. And imagine 
if you didn't care. Imagine if it was totally cool for your kid to like somebody else more than you, to enjoy their time with the other parent more than they enjoy their time with you. Not forever, not for their whole life, just for right now. And I mean, if we were working together, I'd push you even further and say, maybe it is for their whole life. Is that a problem? Is that okay? Why are you even a parent? Is it so that your kid likes you? Or is it so that you do right by your kid, whether they like you or not? It's tricky, isn't it? So that that's that sort of mindset piece. Obviously, we're not going to cure and heal all of those wounds today on a podcast, but these are important things to look at. And I really encourage you, if you are looking at them and saying, this is making sense to me, but it's way too painful and I don't know how to do it by myself, or I don't want to do it by myself, or it's too painful for me to even consider, even though intellectually I know it makes sense, it might be time for us to chat. And you can tell me all about that without any judgment. I'm ready to receive you with 100% emotional safety. And we can figure it out together. It's not something you can probably figure out all the way just from listening to a short podcast episode. But I always start with the emotional piece because otherwise, when I tell you what do we do, it's kind of just lip service. I'm just talking to nothing, right? Because you're not ready for that yet. So let's look at that second side, that other side of the coin. What do we do when our kid either says straight to your face, like, I like spending time with you, or I like spending time with so-and-so instead of you. Or even if you're just getting that sense, because I've already told you, right? Like release the compare and despair. Well, what's, what's left when we release looking at what the other parent is doing? What's left is us. What's left is ourselves. Now we can start to look at not am I doing as well as this other person or, or what does my, this other person do and what do I do? And let me compare those two things. But instead, like, let me just look at my relationship with my kid. Let me just look at myself. How do I feel things are going between me and my kid? Do I like how it feels in our relationship? When I look at how I'm showing up, how do I feel about that? Is it something I'm proud of? Does it align with my values? Or do I think that I might be falling short of my own mark? Because what usually happens, and this is what happened today in the group, is when we started honing in on, you know, let's not think about anyone but ourselves, eyes on your own work, you know, so to speak, what this mom realized was one of the reasons why she was so activated by her kiddo saying, I prefer daddy over you is because she had been showing up in ways in her relationship with her kid that she kind of already felt like she didn't really like. And so her kiddo saying, I don't like you, or her hearing her kid say, I don't like you, whether that's what her kid actually said or not, that's what this mom heard, right? Her hearing that really just almost confirmed the feelings that she was having of inadequacy and maybe regret. That's where your energy needs to go. Let's look at that. And then we can even get even more specific and say like, okay, how, how accurate is it actually that you're falling short of the mark or are you being too hard on yourself? Do you have unrealistic expectations? Are your standards you're holding to yourself unrealistic? That's where we can start looking at it. And then we can start saying, okay, well, if you don't like, like this mom, for example, was saying that she felt like she was nagging too much and she, she really didn't like that. And in the end of our call, she kind of was like, well, I could understand why she might not really like being around me. I'm nagging her a lot and I know I'm doing that. Okay, great. Let's just work on nagging. This has nothing to do with whether you're as good as or better than or worse than some other parent. This has nothing to do with which which parent this kiddo prefers because like I said that's like the blowing of the winds and the weather it's not forever this is about you knowing that this particular way of being that you have been doing doesn't sit right with you because I want you to imagine once again I'm totally cool with you not liking me it's not a problem totally cool with like how whatever emotions you're feeling I love that you love your other parent that's fabulous don't care at all what your opinions are. And also I feel super solid and aligned in how I'm showing up as a parent. I want you to imagine that's the state you're in and your kid comes to you and says, I don't like you. I want to be with this other person. 
what is likely to be your response? Probably, first of all, total acceptance. And then here's what our, here's where the, what do you do kind of stuff comes in. Validate the emotion. Wow. That's so cool. I'm hearing you say that you're really loving your time with daddy, for example, or I'm hearing you say that you really love spending time with mommy and then curiosity, some great open-ended empowering questions that are not about you sussing out whether you're bad or good or what you need to do differently. It's just about helping your kiddo explore this emotion that they have come to you to share with you. And that's the last point I'll make for you. If your child is coming to you and telling you their honest, negative emotions about you, you're doing something right. And it's an opportunity for you to continue to do something right by receiving that healthily and with emotional intelligence. So just the fact that you are getting the message from your child, this kid doesn't like me, is a sign that you're probably nailing it more than you think you are. And I'm going to leave you with that because it's a really big deal and it's super true. And hopefully it was a little bit of an aha for you. I really love doing these podcasts for you all. If you're listening to this stuff and feeling like, I just really want to get more of this in my life. I'm ready for this to be a dialogue, not a monologue. I'm ready for me to be proactive and actually implementing and getting support and accountability. It's time for us to meet. You hear me every week talk about this free discovery call. That call is for you. It's not for all the other parents listening to this podcast. It's for you specifically. You could be the parent that I talk about having this really great epiphany and working through and getting amazing results next week on the podcast. Who knows? Set it up. It's free. You have nothing to lose. And I can't wait to hear your story. Get clear on what your goals are and give you my honest feedback. Have a great week, everybody. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Welcome to Confessions of a Parent Coach. I'm coach, mother of four and potty talker and Kaplan. This is the podcast where I confess something from my own parenting and coaching life, teach a lesson around it, and answer your questions. Even we parenting experts are far from perfect, and the real magic happens when we get down with all that imperfection. We get into the gritty side of parenting here, so earbud up and dive in.